My name is the VA Krisher. It's wonderful to welcome you here as one of the co-conveners of the Sydney Asian Art Series. Uh, I can confirm that the lights are indeed very bright, so I can't see anybody, but I know that there's a number of friends and colleagues here, which is lovely. Um, I would like to thank uh, Matt Cox, who's been a, a great collaborator also, but um, more broadly, uh, the Art Gallery of New South Wales has been a collaborator on this series since 2017, and of course, the very generous support of VisAsia has kept us all going. Um, it's wonderful to be here in what's now the seventh year of the series, um, and of course, you know, the series has pivoted online under COVID, it's changed its format, um, and this year, uh, it's very exciting that we're able to uh, have a, our in, in, inaugural um, uh, research fellow, our scholar in residence, Dr. Melody uh, Rod Ari, who's who's here with us tonight. So you're you're here for a first um, in the series in terms of its format. I'll say a little bit about the series format, um, and then I'm going to ask a couple of questions to Melody to get us underway in lieu of the usual uh, introduction. Um, so the series uh, from this year for the next three, year is f three years is focusing on the theme, or the overarching theme of kura, um, the word that's at the root of um, curatorship and curatorial work. Uh, and we're really trying to unpack that across three years uh, in terms of collection, community and care. So this year we're focusing on collection, uh, next year community and the year after that care. And so Melody has... Um, very graciously joined us in Sydney to talk a bit about her research um, that you'll hear about in a moment. Um, and earlier in the year, we've had uh, two speakers already, um, Kav Professor Kavita Singh and uh, Dr. Yael Rice. Um, and I have to also register um, the, the sad, shocking kind of news that um, Kavita Singh just recently passed away. And she's been a real inspiration for many in the field, has a very warm uh, and sharp uh, wit, which she shared with us earlier in the year. If you did miss her talk, um, it, it is online now, um, but many of us have been kind of um, coming to terms, I guess, with the, the, the news, and I wanted to register that here this evening as well. Um, so, uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll sort of get into our introductions. Um, on a, a brighter note, uh, it's really special to have Melody here. Uh, I would like to welcome you to Sydney. She's been here already for a little while with her family, which is wonderful, and just recently went to Canberra. Um, and that really tells you about what the uh, research um, fellowship is about. So our scholar in residence is coming to spend three or four weeks, um, not just for a public talk, but also to network, meet peers and colleagues, um, and also look into collections. And so you'll see, I think, the relationship to some of the, the work that um, Melody will be presenting tonight to collections and issues that are live and ongoing here. Um, so we're very excited to see that happening. Um, Melody, very briefly, is currently Associate Professor uh, and Chair of Art History at Loyola Marymount University in California. And um, I'll say just briefly that her research um, has touched and focused on Buddhist visual culture in Thailand and the history of collecting, um, in, in uh, collecting South and Southeast Asian art in America, particularly in um, California. So. What I wanted to start with um, to get us kind of underway, um, I'm always interested in people's academic journeys, how they got to what they're working on. Um, and we don't often get a chance to talk about that and get a sense of the person um, behind uh, the speaker, the work that they're doing. Uh, so I wanted to start with your doctoral research. And I know that you're working on um, areas now that cross along, uh, across sort of Buddhist studies, um, Thai studies, um, art history, um, you work on architecture, um, and I wanted to ask how you got into these subjects, um, and particularly I know that your work has focused on um, the Temple of the Emerald Buddha uh, that's now in Bangkok, uh, and I wondered if you could sort of tell us a little bit, about, a bit more about that and its significance uh, for people who are unfamiliar. Well, first, thank you so much for being here this evening. I'm very grateful to all of you. You could be doing anything else. Um, I'm told that there's not a game tonight, but <laughs> but you could be doing anything else and you're here. So I'm very grateful to that. In regards to how I became interested in becoming an art historian and, and the work that I do, um, it's very biographical, in fact, and it was just really about trying to find myself and 
my family's history as someone who was born in the US to parents who had um, come to the US for a variety of reasons. So my mother was born in Vientiane and left Laos um, because of the war and my father wanted to study abroad. Um, and so he ended up in the US. And so I've told this story once before, I think while I've been here, but one of my earliest memories is um, when I was very young, I was probably a year and a half or two years old. And I remember very distinctly, I remember what I was wearing. I, was remember, I remember what my father was wearing. Um, and he came into my bedroom crying. And it was the day that my father had learned that my grandfather passed away. And, and I think that that had a really specific effect on me as a, as a child and throughout my life without my even knowing it. And so just a little background, my grandfather was an artist um, when he was alive. And in fact, for those of you who have been to Bangkok perhaps, uh, he did some of the restoration work to the paintings at the Temple of the Emerald Buddha or Wat Prakeo. So oftentimes when I would see images of my grandfather, it was a picture of him but then right next to it would be an image of the Emerald Buddha. And so, I, again, I think that over time that just became part of my wanting to discover who I was and my background. And so my work, my doctoral work is actually on the Emerald Buddha, which is, I argue, a 15th century icon. Um, and then I also worked on you know, the paintings that are at the temple as well as the architecture, so studying all of those different facets of it. Um, so, and it was an act of rebellion as well. So for those of you in the audience who may be part of the Asian diaspora or maybe not, um, uh, you, know, you really only have five choices for your occupation, um, my choices were to become an engineer, a medical doctor, let's see what else, a lawyer, I think an accountant was one of them, something else in the hard sciences. And so becoming an art historian was really an act of rebellion <laughs> as well. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I wanted to, to then take that, I guess you've just said that you became an art historian, but after your studies, mm -hmm. Um, of course, you're a curator, and I know that you're at the Norton Simon Museum and in Pasadena. Um, and since then, you've also curated, uh, I think, part of the redesign at the Pacific Asia Museum at USC, um, University of Southern California. Uh, and so I'm, I'm curious as to whether the, your interest in provenance and collections history um, was stemming from your experience as a curator. Could you tell us a little bit about what that experience was like, um, what these institutions are like for those of us who are unfamiliar and how that may or may not relate to what you're talking about tonight? Yeah, most definitely. So my interest in provenance work and the history of objects and their coming into museums and their display has everything to do with my work as a museum curator. So while I was at the Norton Simon Museum, for those of you who may not be familiar, um, Norton Simon was an industrialist. Uh, he made a lot of money. Uh, some businesses that you may have heard that um, at one point in time were part of his empire was uh, Avis Rent-A-Car, Pampers, um, Hunt's Ketchup, for example. And with that money, he bought pretty much anything that he wanted. So not only does he have an excellent collection of South Asian art, but he also has an excellent collection of Southeast Asian works on top of his love of um, impressionist work as well. Um, while I was at the Norton Simon, I was the Asian art curator who oversaw the return of the uh, sculpture of Bima, which I'll show you an image of a little bit later, um, from Prasat Chen. And so when I left the museum to return to academia, I thought, well, I suddenly have this um, you know, liberty that I just didn't have as a museum curator. As a museum curator, I was the face, the outward face of the museum. Um, but as an academic, I had more freedom to write what I wanted to and on the topics that I wanted to and, and had liberty as to what I could say. And so I thought that I had an, 
a perspective um, from which to write about someone who had experience working in a museum, so understanding some of the nuances of you know, how objects come into collections, uh, how it's sometimes very difficult to actually deaccession objects. Um, and, but you know, in my role as a, as a professor, I could write um, freely about these topics. And so that's how I became interested in writing about provenance issues. Thank you. Um, just before I do hand over, uh, because our theme is around sort of curatorial work and, and its histories, I can't help but ask the redesign at the Pacific Asia, could you tell us a little bit about, I guess, the motivations and what was sort of driving your idea of what needed to happen there? Okay, so the redesign of the museum is, um, there's nothing sexy about it. You know, we live in California, so the museum is in Pasadena. Um, and so there are earthquakes. We are prone to earthquakes. And so the redesign was really uh, retrofitting the building so that it would be more stable during earthquakes. Um, there was no substantial budget whatsoever for the redesign. So it was very much, um, uh, what would you say? It was on a budget. At the time, there was no specialist of South or Southeast Asian art at the museum. And so I was asked to come in to redesign the galleries. And so I'll talk a little bit about it today during my talk. Um, but even within their collections, um, they don't have the most stellar objects, let's put it that way. So um, it, you know, having worked with such an amazing collection at the Norton Simon Museum prior to then going to the USC Pacific Asian Museum, I really had to be creative and think creatively of how to make use of the objects that they had and to present a meaningful story. Um, I hope that I've done some justice to the collection, um, but there's a lot of room for improvement, I have to say, yeah. Thank you. Um, now we'll have time for more questions. Yeah. I have other questions, and, um, but I'd like to, to hand over and um, say thank you once again for everyone uh, joining us this evening. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so um, I wish that I was one of those folks who could just wing it, but I'm not. So I'm gonna be reading, so please forgive me, but this ensures that I will be able to touch upon everything that I want to say. Um, so please allow me to first begin by thanking everyone at the University of Sydney's Power Institute and Biz Asia at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. I'd especially like to thank um, Mark Ludbury, Olivier, Nicholas Krogan and Alex Birchmore, who couldn't be with us today from the Powers Institute, as well as all of the curators and staff um, here at the Art Gallery New South Wales, and especially to Matt for taking the time to introduce me. Thank you. So my talk today will introduce the events that led to the 2008 raids of five prominent California museums. as well as the return of hundreds of prehistoric materials to Thailand and the aftermath of the raids 15 years later. While my discussion specifically focuses on Ban Siang materials and California collections, I want to remind all of you that in Sydney, the Art Gallery of New South Wales, as well as the Chow Chuk Museum also have collections of Ban Siang ceramics, which at the moment are not on view at either institution. However, if you are interested in seeing Thai ceramics, the exhibition Brick, Vase, Clay, Cup, Jug, which is currently on view in the South Building at the gallery, does have a handful of Thai ceramics, mostly dating from the 14th to 19th centuries on view. The first half of this talk reflects the research I've conducted for a published book chapter entitled Who Owns Ban Siang? The Discovery, Collection, and Repatriation of Ban Siang Artifacts, which is part of a collection of essays in the book, Returning Southeast Asia's Past, Objects, Museums, and Restitution. For those of you who've already read the book chapter, some of this information will sound incredibly familiar, so I apologize in advance. However, for those of you in the audience tonight for whom the Ban Siang Raids is unfamiliar and new, I hope that you will find the saga interesting. And the second half of the talk examines what has happened 15 years since the raids, as well as a conversation on the importance of art collections to diaspora communities. 
As you and I know, much has been written about who should own the past, and specifically about the objects and artifacts that document antiquity. Scholars, museum curators, government officials, law enforcement, and lawyers have examined the cultural policies and laws that have been enacted to protect cultural property and to determine who has the authority to act as stewards of the past. Scholarship and attention tend to focus on sculptures taken from monuments, not intended to be circulated, such as those from the Parthenon in Greece, which continue to live in collections far from their original sites, such as the British Museum, or other sculptures from Prasat Ten in Cambodia, which have been returned from institutions such as the Norton Simon, as you know, that I used to work at, um, have been since returned uh, to their source country. And I would be remiss if I did not also mention the removal of wooden temple struts from the, um, sorry, temple, uh, wooden struts from the Ratnashwar temple, one of which was repatriated to Nepal from the Art Gallery of New South Wales in recent months. These types of objects, which are part of the architecture of religious monuments, are obvious subjects of attention, as they were never intended to be circulated or removed. But so too are culturally significant and sacred objects, such as the Shiva Nataraja from Shivapuram in India, which were intended to be taken out of their temples for darshan, or the most recently repatriated Chom sculptures that are currently at the National Gallery in Canberra, which certainly would have circulated during their time of use. However, this talk will instead focus on ceramic vessels and small metal tools and jewelry from the village turned archeological site of Bantian in Northern Thailand. While these items were not a part of an architectural program, nor do they have the prestige as royal or religiously sponsored fine art, artifacts from Bantian have significant historic and symbolic value, especially to a modern nation like Thailand. The artifacts associated with Ban Chiang suggest that it is one of the earliest Southeast Asian civilizations to develop wet rice cultivation and the manufacture of metal tools. Ownership and control of these artifacts and their narrative, therefore, allows ties to create a lineage to antiquity, one that situates the nation as one of the earliest and most advanced in the Southeast Asian region. And here, I want to remind those of us in the audience who may not be familiar with the geopolitics of the region of Southeast Asia, that the geographical boundaries that demarcate the beginning and end of one nation from another, and even the titles that we refer to these nations are modern ones. They are the result of conflicts, of war, of colonialism, of independence, of victory, of more war and more conflicts. While Thailand was never colonized, it was impacted by the colonial policies that affected its neighbors. The name Thailand was adopted in 1939, and the borders that today make up the nation were defined in part through treaties with the British and the French in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. However, disputes over territories still remain. This is all to say that it is in Thailand's nationalistic interest to present its history stretching as far back as possible and that its material culture, such as those artifacts from Ban Tiang, can be identified and associated with other culturally similar material and found as widely as possible throughout the region to expand its current political and cultural authority. Ban Tiang is a village and architectural site in Udon Thani province in Thailand. The discovery of the, the archaeological heritage of this um, site has often been credited to the American Stephen Young. However, knowledge of the material culture associated with this prehistoric site was previously known to villagers living there. According to the archaeologists Piset Zeron Wong Sa of the Fine Arts Department in Thailand, who was then co-director of the Ban Chiang project, along with Chester Gorman, an archaeologist and anthropologist at the University of Pennsylvania, They've both noted that the prehistoric artifacts were known to villagers by at least 1957. Moreover, in 1960, Ban Chiang was listed as an archaeological site by the Fine Arts Department. It was, however, the confluence of Yang's discovery and his connections to the cultural and political elites of Thailand that led to the formal study and excavations of Ban Chiang. In 1966, Stephen Young, the son of Kenneth Todd Jr., or Todd Young Jr., 
who was appointed ambassador extraordinary and um, plenipotentiary to Thailand from 1961 to 1963, and who later served as the president of the US-based Asia Society from 1963 to 1969, was staying in the village of Ban Chiang to conduct interviews for his senior thesis at Harvard. According to his own assessment, while walking down a road in Ban Chiang, he tripped on a tree root and fell over, landing near a semi-buried ceramic vessel. Recognizing that the object was an ancient artifact and seeing that other similar objects were buried close by, he brought ceramic samples with him to Bangkok, where he was staying with Princess Chumbot. The princess was a collector of art as well as the proprietor of the Suan Pakat Museum, which today has an important collection of Ban Chiang materials. The princess made Young's discovery known to the Thai Finance Department, who began excavations in 1967, as well as to Elizabeth Lyons, who was at the time with the Ford Foundation in Bangkok. When preliminary excavations by the Fine Arts Department in with sorry, when the preliminary excavations began by the Fine Arts Department in 1967, Lyons had samples from the dig sent to the University of Pennsylvania for thermal luminescence testing. However, results were not made to 1970. The results of the TL testing brought back startling numbers, dating the Banqiang samples to 5,000 to 3,000 BCE. The dating of the samples to this date was astonishing because if they were accurate, as many scholars, specialists, and interested parties believed they were at the time, it implied that Banqiang was the site of the earliest wet rice cultivation and Bronze Age in the world predating that of even the Middle East, India, and China. The dates soon spread to the public via news articles and televised programming and came to be associated with any artifact discovered at Ban Chiang, regardless of its medium or stratigraphic location within the archeological site. What the test and its result effectively accomplished was the reorientation of long conceived ideas that Southeast Asia owed much, owed much of its technological and cultural development to outside influence, principally interactions with the early Chinese. Later excavations led by the University of Pennsylvania and the Thai Fine Arts Department beginning in 1974 led to the scientific unearthing of much more material which could then be tested by both TL and carbon-14 testing. These new dates associated the Ban Chiang um, to much later dates with the earliest suggested manufacture of bronze beginning in 2000 to 1000 BCE. This new dating, however, did not and has not changed the importance of Ban Chiang to those involved and affected by the site's discovery. This is because it still implies that it was the site of the earliest rice cultivation and metal use in the region. Moreover, its material culture is proof that Thailand specifically and Southeast Asia more generally was not a cultural backwater that lacked artistic sophistication before contact with India and China. News of the importance of Ban Chiang circulated widely among villagers and politicians, as well as collectors and dealers, both local and international. Unsurprisingly, everyone wanted a piece of Ban Chiang. Local villagers began subsistence looting and selling artifacts to whomever was interested in purchasing them. This activity was encouraged, and as noted by the Thai archaeologist Ratani Tosarat in her article, The Destruction of the Cultural Heritage of Thailand and Cambodia, she writes that a lecturer at a well-known Bangkok university encouraged villagers to dig and sell artifacts to him for his private collection. It is also reported that collectors and dealers in Bangkok began making organized trips to Ban Chiang. Among an ardent collector was the princess, who many have argued made the collecting of Ban Chiang artifacts fashionable, resulting in the extensive looting of the sites. And here I want to pause to thank Stephen Miller, who is the senior librarian at the Art Gallery Library, because not more than a week ago, he helped to pull correspondence files for me from the David Jones Gallery archives. In these archives, I found letters between various art dealers in Thailand and Robert Haynes, the then director of the David Jones Gallery, but who before this appointment in 1961 was the director of the National Gallery in Victoria, and before then the director of the Queensland Art Gallery. It was in looking at these files that I discovered a new perspective on the rise and interest of Ban Chiang ceramics. 
Not only were collectors interested in owning some of Thailand's earliest material culture, but apparently recent thefts of Buddhist, oh, sorry, I should have had it come up a little earlier. Um, but to return, um, apparently in 1969, Buddhist images were stolen from Wat Po in Bangkok. And this led to the arrest of two art dealers. This also resulted in a brief pause on the sale and purchase of Buddhist statuary as dealers and buyers were unsure of the implications and pending laws that would result. Here I provide you with just one example of correspondence with a dealer in Bangkok, here a Mr. Chai, who states that he has, quote, stopped buying sculptures, but concentrating on ceramics, unquote, which he offers to sale to Heinz. By 1971, the David Jones Gallery starts buying a number of Neolithic ceramics, presumably from Ban Chiang. And I offer here a receipt from another Bangkok dealer, um, Peng Sang, which dates to 1973. And so here you can see a list of some of the, um, some of the items that are purchased, most likely from Ban Chiang. By 1972, much of the sites had been dug up and artifacts interred were offered for sale. Such unmitigated destruction led to a law passed by the National Executive Council in 1972, which prohibited the sale, purchase, or transport of Banqiang artifacts. In addition to the passage of the 1972 law, the king sponsored a small excavation, which was intended to curtail the looting, sale, and purchase of Banqiang artifacts. By the time the excavation began by the royal team, much of the upper layers had been dug up by villagers. According to Gorman, by 1975, he was unable to locate any area in the village that had not been looted. The looting of the area and the continued sale of Banqiang materials continued to persist and even spawned a market of fakes. Today, many of those looted objects and modern copies can be found in museums um, all over the world, including Thailand. Um, and so I'm just pulling up a, a couple of institutions where you can find Banqing materials. Here, are the Asian Civilizations Museum in Singapore, the British Museum in London, uh, the National Gallery in Canberra, the uh, Met Museum in New York, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in Los Angeles, the um, Minneapolis Institute of Art in Minneapolis, as well as the Art Gallery of New South Wales. While we find these materials throughout the world, the largest concentration of publicly known Banqiang artifacts outside of Thailand are found in American museums. This is owing to the American presence in Thailand in the 1960s and 70s during the Vietnam War, when the US had several satellite Air Force bases in the country. One of these bases was in Urantani province, where the village of Banqiang is located. The same excitement that led Thai elites to collect Banqiang artifacts has spread to Amer American officers and officials. The princess's anxiety of the rampant looting was conveyed to Lyons, who she told, quote, they will ship them all out of the country before the fine arts department does anything, unquote. Skeptical of the princess's claims, Lyons inspected the situation for herself, and she writes, quote, I didn't really think an old clay pot was a GI's idea of a souvenir, but when I went with her to see for myself, she was right. The whole village acted like bargain day at Gimbel's. Some houses had the merchandise set up on tables besides the house or on the ladder-like steps. Fresh pits under and around every house showed where the stock had come from, and here and there were clusters of Thai and American soldiers bargaining and buying." Unquote. Some of the donated artifacts in American museums have come from individuals or family members of American officers and officials who likely purchased or were gifted the objects during their time in Thailand. The largest concentration of such gifts are found in Southern California, where I live, it is also in this region of the US that dealers of Banqiang artifacts such as John and Carrie Markell and Robert Olson conducted their business. In the early mornings of January 20, uh, sorry, in the early morning of January 24th, 2008, federal agents served search warrants to five museums, the Bowers Museum of Art, LACMA, the Minge International Museum, USC Pacific Asia Museum, 
and the Berkeley Museum of Art, as well as two art dealers, Markel, who owned the Silk Roads, um, Silk Roads Gallery. Sorry, so this is the kind of the facade of these institutions. Um, and here's an image of, of John and Carrie Markell, as well as the owner of um, Bobby O Imports, Robert Olson, and the staff members of all of these institutions. Search warrants sought to examine the museum's collections and files associated with Markell and Olson. While museums and the public learned of the investigations in 2008, these investigations by three different American federal agencies, the National Park Service, the Internal Revenue Service, the Immigration and, Con and Customs Enforcement, began five years earlier in 2003. This investigation was justified by evidence collected by Special Agent, uh, Special National Park Service Agent Todd Swain, who went undercover as the collector Thomas Hoyt and presented himself as an eager collector to Olson, who sold him artifacts, arranged for inflated appraisals, and introduced him to dealers and museum curators, such as uh, the Markells. As Hoyt, Agent Swain sought to purchase antiquities in order to donate them to museums to be used as a tax deduction. And in the summer of 2006, I was working in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Art at LACMA and met with both Olson and um, uh, Todd Swain, who wanted to see if the museum was interested in donations of Ban Chiang and other prehistoric Thai materials. Hoyt explained to me that he was a collector who made his money in tech, and he was very eager to make a donation before tax season. Comically, he arrived to the museum dressed as Steve Jobs, so you can imagine what that looks like. He had jeans and a black, you know, black shirt. Um, I was very suspicious of him, so I kept his business card all of these years, <laughs> and I happened to find it in my files before I left for Sydney, so I took a photograph of it. I was instructed at the time by the museum that the department was not interested in donations, and I conveyed this information to both Hoyt, or to Swain, and to Olson. And although LACMA did not accept any donations from them, the four other institutions did and accepted gifts from them between 2003 to 2007. So this investigation really sought to curtail two separate but related offenses, the trafficking of illicit materials and tax evasion. Affidavits lodged with the US Central District of California court state that investigators had cause to believe that Markel and Olson had been illegally dealing in archeological materials from Southeast Asia, and that both had committed tax fraud by inflating the values of objects donated to museums. The museums were also implicated as they were accused of enabling the conspiracy to prepare false tax returns. In the over 150 pages of text that make up the affidavits, some museum officials are quoted as saying that they were aware the Banchang artifacts may not have been legally acquired, nor have adequate documentation regarding their provenance to warrant their acceptance into their collections. However, these same museum officials later accepted gifts from Hoyt. Also included in the affidavits were damaging information regarding the business of illegally exporting these artifacts by Markel and Olson, in which they describe purchasing objects from smugglers and looters and putting them in their luggage and um, bringing them back to the US. Once in the US, these objects were sold to collectors for one price and then given a much higher appraised value. It was this appraised value um, that was given to museums, which could then be used as tax-deductible charitable gifts for the donor. For example, in June of 2006, the undercover agent Swain purchased an item at the cost of $1,500 US from Markel, and that same object was appraised by Markel to $4,990 and then donated to the Minge International Museum. In addition to the objects themselves and their appraisals, museums were also given information regarding the object's provenance and authenticity, as neither Markel nor Olson were specialists of Southeast Asian ceramics. Markel included in his sale appraisals by Dr. Roxana Brown, a renowned um, art historian specializing in Southeast Asian ceramics, and then was the director of the Southeast Asian Ceramics Museum in Bangkok University. On May 9th, 2008, Brown was arrested in Seattle, Washington, 
while she was there to give an academic lecture and was indicted by a Los Angeles grand jury for wire fraud for allowing Markel to use her signature for inflated appraisals. Although she was not among the principal individuals that led to the investigation, and in fact, she was actually among those who acted as an informant, she was the first to be indicted. Five days later, she died of health complications in the Seattle jail. After her death, the single charge made against her was dropped. A month later, Markel and Olson were indicted for conspiracy and false statements regarding entry of goods. This indictment focused on objects from Myanmar and Cambodia, and later indictments in 2010 and 2012 made formal complaints against the Markels and Olson's dealings in Bantiang artifacts. In 2015, Jonathan Markel was sentenced to, six, to 18 months in prison for false declarations while importing antiquities, and both he and his wife were sentenced to probation for tax evasion, as well as paying monetary fines to offset costs related to seized materials from their commercial gallery. Olson was never indicted, as his trial was delayed several times owing to his poor health, and he died in 2017 before any trial could take place. To date, no museum officials or curators have been indicted. And this is incredibly important. It's important because if this case had gone to trial, based on the facts alleged in the search warrants and premised on the current language of the National Stolen Property Act in the US, the outcome of either an acquittal or a conviction would have had detrimental consequences to American museums. An acquittal would have effectively allowed antiquities to be bought and sold within the court's jurisdiction with impunity. A conviction would transform the continued possession of most antiquities, not just those from Thailand, in any museum within the court's jurisdiction, and not just those museums involved in this case, in violation of the NSPA. To put it another way, continued possession of virtually all unprovenance antiquities in public museums in the court's jurisdiction would become actionable under the NSPA and museums would be obligated to remove such works from their collections promptly. So you can imagine what implications this would have everywhere else as well. The slow pace of the investigation and action since the raids in 2008 has been frustrating for all parties. To date, the Bowers Museum, which, which you see here, as well as the Minge International Museum are the only institutions to have successfully returned objects to Thailand. Many factors have delayed investigations, including the often neglected fact that the Thai government was not and has not actively requested the return of these artifacts. The investigations began and continue to be led by US federal agencies. According to the offices of the Deputy Director General of the Department of Information in Thailand, it was the, Thai Royal, it was the Royal Thai Consulate General in Los Angeles who was informed in 2019 by the Cultural Relations Division of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the US government to request that the Thai Finance Department send experts to inspect and screen the artifacts at the Bowers Museum. It was at this time, so in 2009, that a delegation of curators, senior scientists, and government officials from the Thai Fine Arts Department traveled to Santa Ana, where the Bowers Museum location, or museums, sorry, to examine the Bowers Museum's collection where it is located. And during these three days of investigation, these experts um, from both Thailand and from the US worked hard to identify a very large number of artifacts. The goal of the three-day investigation was to identify if the objects in the Bowers collection had indeed come from Thailand. And uh, five years later, on August 24, 2014, the Bowers Museum transferred over 500 artifacts to Thailand in exchange for a non-persecution agreement, ensuring that the museum's staff would not be indicted of criminal charges. The Bowers by this time had become well known for its Banchan collection and even had one of the earliest exhibitions dedicated to the culture at the museum in 1985. This was owing to its um, chief curator, Armand LeBay, who was interested in the material and later wrote many books on Banqiang. However, I should mention that there was an earlier exhibition on Banqiang that um, toured the, the United States that was sponsored by the National Museums Divisions of Thailand um, and the University of Pennsylvania Museum as well in 1982. 
LeBay died in 2005 before the raids, but during the investigation. In 2016, the Mingay International Museum returned 83 of their Banqiang objects to Thailand. Once returned, the artifacts from the Bowers Museum were examined by archeologists and specialists within the fine arts department in Thailand, who went through the process of cataloging the objects, many of which were de um, determined to be modern copies. Exemplary artifacts were later put on display for international and local media outlets as a at a formal ceremony at the National Museum in Bangkok on November 19th, 2014. The ceremony provided both the US and Thai governments the opportunity to demonstrate their commitment against looting and acknowledge the importance of cultural property to national identity. The repatriation of these materials to Thailand and their continued circulation in the public realm is significant for a variety of reasons. First and foremost, the return of cultural property that has clearly been looted or unlawfully acquired acknowledges the historic and economic challenges that source countries such as those in Southeast Asia have in protecting and securing their cultural patrimony. Second, the, recircul the recirculation of repatriated items in the public sphere, such as those now at the National Museum, helps to reanimate the histories of these objects, both their ancient and more recent past. For example, the special exhibitions of returned Banqiang materials reminded, or perhaps made known for the first time to visitors, of the importance of this prehistoric culture, not only to Thai history, but also to the region, as well as its importance in contemporary global scholarship and politics. Their returns resulted in increased interest among the public and institutions to stage a more formal exhibition one year later entitled Early Man of Our Time at the National Museum. In this way, the return of objects from the Bowers and the Mingay International Museum's collections to Thailand represents an ideal outcome of such cases. While the Bowers and Mingay are no, long, no longer have in their collections Banqiang artifacts, Visitors to the aforementioned museums could easily walk away from their visits with the impression that no such collections similarly exist at these institutions. Since 2008, Banqiang artifacts that were prominently displayed in galleries have been put into storage, and in some, case, some cases, even their digital existence at the museum has been concealed. So for example, I'd just like to show you um, the Bowers Museum. Oh, so these are the other institutions that have yet to return their collections. But if we look at the Bowers Museum, because much of its Southeast Asian collections were those related to Ban Chiang, and with these collections now gone, the, the gallery dedicated to the region of Southeast Asia was reduced to size. Um, a visitor today looking for art related to the region of Southeast Asia will find only this spare hallway um, which one of my students said he uh, happened upon because he was looking for the bathroom. And so this is actually a photograph that my student generously shared with me. Um, and you will notice that not only is the space very small, but only a handful of objects are on display. At LACMA, we have a somewhat different situation in that the building where Southeast Asian art was housed has been dismantled. So this is what the institution looked like um, just a few years ago. So it's a sprawling campus of many buildings, but um, it's undergoing a, you know, a redesign and part of the buildings and specifically the part of the buildings that housed the Southeast Asian collections has been dismantled. So since 2017, all of the museum Southeast Asian collection was put in storage. The new wing, which will be designed, or has been designed rather, by the architect Peter Zumthor, which you see here, is expected to open in late 2024. It is unclear what prominence the Southeast Asian collections will have in the new buildings, as there has not been a curator of Southeast Asian art at the museum since 2020. And in fact, there isn't even a South Asian specialist as well at the museum. So, Typically, if there isn't a Southeast Asian specialist, it would be the South Asian specialist who would oversee the Southeast Asian collection. If we go to the USC Pacific Asian Museum, the Southeast Asian galleries are primarily focused um, on statuary. At the time that the galleries were being redesigned in 2017 and 2018, so we briefly touched upon this during our fireside chat, if you will, there was no one at the museum who specialized in either South or Southeast Asian art, and so I was brought on as a consulting curator. The current layout and display of the Southeast Asian galleries is the result of my work, 
uh, my work at the museum. So any fault is a fault of my own. Um, at the time, I was told that it would be best not to display the Banqing ceramics because they were still under custody of the US government. And so for that reason, um, the only display of uh, ceramics from Southeast Asia uh, are much later and are predominantly focused on those from Vietnam. Now, USC has a prominent collection of Asian ceramics, including those from the region of Southeast Asia, which number over 350 objects. However, walking through the museum today, one wouldn't know that. While there is a small gallery dedicated to ceramics, which you see here, um, it has been closed since the pandemic in 2020. When it was open, only a handful of ceramics from the region of Southeast Asia were on display, and those from Banqiang were reduced to just one small vessel and sherds, which you see here. And I was told by the current curator of the museum, who is a specialist of Thai art, that the gallery will be redesigned um, in the next year and will be used as a space focusing on curatorial practice rather than on ceramics. So what this effectively means is that we're never gonna see the Banqiang materials uh, at the USC Pacific Asian Museum. The invisibility of the Banqiang material, often the only prehistoric Southeast Asian material at these museums is detrimental to public understanding of not only Southeast Asian art history and culture, but I also argue to our broader human history. It might be hyperbolic to suggest that the removal of Banqiang artifacts to storage vaults at these institutions is equivalent to the period before their discovery in the 1960s, when Southeast Asia was considered a cultural backwater. However, the lack of educational material available on prehistoric Southeast Asia for the broader public might argue otherwise. Even in higher education, few universities have specialists that work or lecture on prehistoric Southeast Asia, let alone those who specifically focus on Banqiang. While these materials sit in storage, bigger legal and ethical questions loom, such as should all of these artifacts in the US, minus those, minus those acquired through partage or through gifts by the Thai government be considered stolen property? What should happen to these collections in and outside of Thailand? As noted by archaeologists working at the site in the 1970s, much of the material had been looted by the time their excavations had begun. It was, and it was these looted objects that became part of the Thai and International Museum collections. If one only looks to the Thai 1961 Act, it clearly states that objects from archaeological sites are property of the state and that ownership of such objects and their removal from Thailand is prohibited without proper license. It's unlikely that many of the Banqiang materials now housed in American museums have as part of their provenance such a license, proving their legality. If one accepts the 1961 Act in isolation, what should museums with Banqiang artifacts do with their collections? It seems counterintuitive to repatriate all of the Banqiang collections from non-Thai government institutions as a preventative measure against looting, which is among one of the major goals of cultural property laws, as much of Banqiang had been looted by the 1970s. Moreover, Thai officials have not actively sought the return of this material, whereas they have sought the return of other types of objects in the past, such as this lintel from Prasat Pimai, which was repat repatriated from the Art Institute of Chicago in 1988, and at present, the Thai government is seeking the return of some 700 objects, one of which is this Bodhisattva of Kiteshvara in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum. While remaining sensitive to the continued and rampant looting of cultural heritage that still takes place today, perhaps in thinking about these questions, we can return to those early days of the discovery of Banqiang, when scholars and non-scholars all over the world were excited and enthusiastic to learn about this important prehistoric site and those participating in its excavations were eager to make their discoveries known. It was the artifacts found at the site that brought such realizations to light, as well as excitement of Southeast Asia's prominence in world histories. And it will continue to be these artifacts that can serve as cultural ambassadors of Thailand to those who are not able to travel there. The absence of Banqiang artifacts outside of Thailand reduces our collective understanding of prehistoric Southeast Asia, and moreover, has the potential to stifle entire fields of study, which rely on new students who are eager to learn and discover more about the ancient past. 
And for me, the absence of Banchek material is personal. As I've already noted, so um, Olivier, you know, kind of read my mind, I guess, when he was putting together the questions. I am a member of the Southeast Asian diaspora living in the US. My mother moved to the US from Vientiane and my father from Bangkok in the late 1960s and early 1970s, respectively. And I was born in a small city that you have probably never heard of, Des Moines, in the state of Iowa. And I include this small vignette into my life as a way to express to everyone how important it has been to me, to my family, and other immigrants, including my students, to have access to our own cultural history through art found in our local museums, in our new homes that are so far away from our original homelands. Being able to see a Lao textile or a Buddhist sculpture from Thailand in the same building as a painting by Claude Monet, a sculpture from ancient Rome, or a bronze vessel from China has always made me proud because it meant that my culture, my history, was just as important as those other cultures. And I should add that it was seeing these objects in museums that also inspired me further to become an art historian and a museum curator because I didn't realize that these were professions that were possible until I saw them in the museum. And while I'm incredibly sensitive and sympathetic and supportive of efforts by individuals and institutions and governments in repatriating their cultural patrimony, especially as such materials were taken often violently during periods of colonialism and war, both before and after occupation, as a professor and as a scholar of art history, I worry that the pendulum for an interest in Southeast Asian art generally and Thai art more specifically might swing in the opposite direction in the future. So what happens when enough works of art have been repatriated and not enough works of art remain abroad to sustain the interest of a global audience outside of their source countries? Will traveling shows of masterpieces then be sent to countries all over the world by repatriating governments? Like they were long after hard fights, uh, long hard fights for independence, such as the 1947 exhibition of Indian art sponsored by the Indian government, or the 1960 exhibition of Thai art sponsored by the Thai government during the Cold War? Will there be an appetite or an interest for such traveling exhibitions then? Having worked as a museum, I know that most museum patrons will flock to blockbuster shows and pay fees to enter exhibitions um, populated by paintings by Matisse than Van Gogh. But will they queue up to buy admission tickets to a special exhibition of art from Cambodia or Thailand? Not many, for sure. Will museum administrators have the stomach to pay for such traveling exhibitions, anticipating that such exhibitions might not draw on as many visitors? This is my fear as a professor and as a scholar. If the objects that I teach with are no longer there, I will not be able to share the richness of their histories with new generations who hopefully will find enough interest in them and the cultures that they represent to study them and to invest in the places from where they come from. And as a scholar, I think many have forgotten, or perhaps never knew, that there was a time when art from Southeast Asia was not worthy of being presented alongside masterpieces of Western art and museums, or even those objects from our East Asian neighbors, such as Japan and China. Indeed, it was art historians like Ananda Kumar Swami and Stella Kreimresh who fought for the inclusion of South Asian art in fine arts institutions and in the study of art history in the West in the early 20th century. Once the door was opened for South Asian art, the display and study of Southeast Asian art followed. This helps us to understand why the early collecting of Southeast Asian art in such institutions were heavily focused on Hindu and Buddhist material. It was because the acceptance of Southeast Asian art was linked to its connections to South Asia. As a member of the diaspora, the presence of Southeast Asian art generally, and Thai and Lao art more specifically, in institutions outside of the region is important to me as it is an acknowledgement of my presence and my inclusion. To date, much of the conversation around the repatriation of cultural heritage has centered on restoring past wrongs and, the make, and making these objects available to the peoples of the source countries from which they come from. However, I think it is important to also include a conversation on how the very same objects play an important role for the diaspora as well. 
In this way, I hope that museums here in Australia and elsewhere that have been impacted as of late by the repatriation of objects can work with their diaspora communities to find a solution that encourages continued sharing and access to our shared human heritage. Thank you.